Klaus Center Initiative on Religion and Democracy. It is a pleasure to see all of you here. My name is Jonathan Lawrence. I am director of the Klaus Center for the study of constitutional democracy and a professor of political science. This is the Klaus Center's third public gathering of the semester. And religion and democracy is the third of several themes that we are promoting for collective reflection this year. The first focused on what the Constitution means to us and featured 16 speakers from across the faculty and student body, including several of our own fellows. Then in September, we launched our annual theme of journalism and democracy with a set of conversations with scholars and senior correspondents. And our spring symposium on journalism and democracy will be held in March with a keynote by Yamish Alcindor. Today, I am honored to launch our multi-year initiative on religion and democracy with a discussion of my new book, Coping with Defeat, and I am so grateful to each member of the panel for being here and to the guests in attendance who went out of their way to uh, come to campus. Our next event in this series will feature a speaker on the impact of social media on religion in January after the break. Before then, we will be discussing the prospects for democracy worldwide with scholars Craig Calhoun and Elizabeth McKenna on November 17th and with Sidney Tarot and Marshall Gans on December 8th. So please see our website for more information. I am grateful to my colleague from Emerson College, Professor Carol Ferrara, for agreeing to chair today's session. Carol is a scholar of religion and politics, specializing in matters of faith, plurality, ethics, and national identity. She also wrote a fantastic chapter in a new volume I edited called Secularism in Comparative Perspective, coming out next month. I will now hand the floor over to Carol uh, to chair today's session and make introductions. So please, Carol. Thank you, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Um, and many thanks for you, to you all for joining us this evening. <clears throat> I'm so very honored to be part of this, uh, this panel this evening to discuss such a rich and innovative new piece of scholarship, um, Jonathan's new book, um, in the company of such distinguished scholars working at the intersection of religion, history, and politics. Today, we'll be hearing uh, from three panelists. Unfortunately, Karen Barkey is unable to join us this evening. Um, and you can find, I'm going to briefly introduce them now, but you can find their more extensive introductions using this QR code here at the bottom of your intro panels. Um, so I'm going to int briefly introduce our panelists and also give a little clue as to what they'll be speaking, from what perspective they're going to be offering the remarks in the book. Um, so first we have Michael Dreisen, who is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Affairs at John Cabot University in Rome. Michael will reflect on the core comparison between Islam and Catholicism and how the book's account is situated within dominant theories of religious life in the nation state era. Massimo Fagioli is a full professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University in Philadelphia. Massimo will offer thoughts regarding how the book's argument relates to issues faced to both external and, exter sorry, external and internal challenges facing the contemporary Catholic Church, in particular, its relationship to democracy. Shadi Hamid is a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings at the Brookings Institution, and an assistant research professor at, of Islamic studies at Fuller Seminary. Shahadi will consider how the book's argument regarding the role of religion in the Muslim world applies to today's Muslim majority nation states and the particular conundrums they face regarding state religion relations. If I may speak on behalf of all of us here, we look forward to a robust and invigorating discussion of Jonathan's book. At this time, I'd like to welcome Jonathan back on stage to offer us, quite generously, for those of you who may not have gotten to all 500 pages of 
the book, uh, a Cliff Notes version of Coping with Defeat. Good afternoon again. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Islam has been in the news lately. This summer felt like a return to the 1990s. There was the US raid on an Al-Qaeda leader, the attempted murder of Salman Rushdie, and the triumph of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Islamic extremism has been a subject of consternation in Europe and the US for the past 25 years. These recent events exacerbated long-standing fears about the capacity of Islam to adapt to the modern world. So what went wrong, as scholar Bernard Lewis asked around the time of 9-11, such that the Islamic world failed to modernize or keep pace with the West? Decades of scholarship offer answers. Many point to the essential unity of religion and politics in Islam, leading to unhealthy alliances between rulers and Islamic jurists, and to the state's capture of Islamic civil society. The verdict has frequently been either that the religion of Islam is inherently incapable of adapting to the nation state, or that Islam must undergo a Protestant revolution. The contention of my book is that neither of these is quite right. I argue that the right comparison is not Protestantism, but Roman Catholicism. Because a century ago, the same things being said now about Islam were then being said about the church. For example, that it resisted the authority of the modern state as well as pluralism, liberalism, and democracy. That was true especially during the six decades when the status of the papacy was in question after the Italian army captured Rome, when the Pope and his supporters sought to restore temporal power of the papacy. At that time, Pius IX even recruited an army of foreign fighters, known as Zouaves, who were blessed by local church leaders before shipping off to combat liberal, secular Italy. Many viewed Catholics as a threat to democracy, who did not respect secularism and who contested public education and family law. Moreover, anarchist attacks across Europe and the US linked political violence and terrorism in the public imagination with Catholic countries and the presence of Catholics in the diaspora. Although scholars have often stressed their differences, there are in fact many pertinent similarities between the historical trajectories of Catholicism and Islam, such that it is highly illuminating to compare them. They expanded in the same area, a few centuries apart, and they organized transnational religious networks, hierarchically, over centuries. Both were not merely religions, but were also associated with vast political empires. Each spiritual leader governed, exerting political rule over millions of subjects. In 1848, the Papal States had three million citizens, more than Holland, Denmark, or Switzerland. In 1922, the Ottoman Empire still had 13 million citizens. And finally, both religions experienced a centuries-long struggle with the modern state, resulting in their loss of political power and existentially challenging their ability to run their own affairs and choose their own personnel. I describe this in my book in terms of three defeats. Each defeat severed religious authorities from large numbers of the faithful, who found themselves stranded under another rule of law. The first defeat is the end of political religious empire, where I compare the Protestant Reformation with the unraveling of the Ottoman Empire. The second came at the hands of the modern nation state, which the Catholic and Muslim worlds experienced one century apart. And the third defeat is the era of unexpected mass migration 
when millions of Catholics left Europe for the United States in the late 19th century and millions of Muslims migrated to Europe after World War II. For both religions, each defeat provoked a multi-pronged institutional response, a religious counter-movement overhauling their infrastructure, their education systems, and their hierarchies. For practical reasons, these emphasized the organization of prayer and rituals for believers across national borders instead of political, exec political executive rule over subjects or citizens at home. While this was done in a spirit of resistance, these were actually the first steps towards achieving compatibility and surviving the encounter with the modern state. However, the paths of Catholicism and Islam notably diverged. A century after the anti-modernism of the first Vatican Council, Catholicism came to be seen as a pillar of democracy. The church made peace with the modern state and embraced spiritual leadership instead of temporal government. Samuel Huntington's observations about the third democratic wave are relevant here. He wrote that cultures evolve and historically are dynamic, not passive. Rigid cultural communities can suddenly acknowledge defeat and reinterpret their traditions to make them compatible with democracy. Catholicism made that adjustment, end quote. Conversely, in the judgment of many today, Sunni Islam has not yet made that adjustment. Why is that the case? The question is particularly vexing because looking back 150 years, one would have expected a different outcome. While the Pope barricaded himself behind Vatican walls and spurned Western democracies, the Sultan was courting them, asserting a place for lands of Sunni Islam under sovereign rule within the international state system. What then accounts for the apparent reversal in these two religions' trajectories? In my book, I argue that much of what is seen as essential to these religions and judged to be compatible or incompatible with the modern state are actually the product of recent history linked to two contingent outcomes from the 1920s, when Catholicism kept its pope, but Sunni Islam lost its caliph. While the caliph was ousted from Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem, and was exiled from Istanbul, the pope maintained home rule and a sovereign parcel of land, strengthening him as an international figure and facilitating his transformation from executive to spiritual rule in the 20th century. The same process was actually underway for Islam, but was disrupted by the European empire's occupation of most of the Muslim world one century ago. Since 1924, Sunni Islam faced an obstacle that Catholicism did not, the lack of a centralized authority with territorial sovereignty. This has sown confusion over the division between religion and politics being discussed here and led to what Mona Hassan calls longing for the lost caliphate. There has been no shortage of candidates most recently, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who was the caliph of the short-lived Islamic State. But within Sunni Islam, none of these candidates had external legitimacy because no institution survived to confer it. The papacy, by contrast, was stripped of its temporal powers but went on to enjoy a robust second life as a spiritual beacon. How and why did this happen? We need to go back to the moment when each religion suffered its first modern defeat. For the modern Catholic Church, that is the Reformation. During the Reformation, of course, a defiant set of national and reform churches arose from Germany, England, Scotland, to Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, and many places in between. The resulting counter-reformation was less about the infamous institutions like the Roman Inquisition and more about a constructive response to stop the losses and to shore up territory. It marks a turning point 
in the professionalization of the global church. New standards emerged from the Council of Trent. Seminaries arose to train priests for Catholic minorities, heavily reliant upon the new Jesuit order. Dioceses were added in wavering countries with increased ratios of church and clergy per believer, and the congregation of Propaganda Fide was created to oversee the religious life of Catholics in a minority or missionary situation. The church did not embrace defeat. The mission of the propaganda was the reconquest of the reformed lands. But where re-Catholicization was impossible, it aimed to preserve minorities abroad and in their own borderlands, and to expand missions overseas through the strategic enlargement of the College of Cardinals. Now for the Islamic counterpart. The Ottoman Empire underwent a similar loss of territory and millions of believers to European empires in the 19th century. These European empires became the world's largest Muslim powers. Nearly two-thirds of all Muslims worldwide lived under French, British, and Dutch rule. But over a 50-year period, these colonial powers uprooted Ottoman seminaries, courts, religious foundations, and they replaced the Sultan Caliph in the religious lives of their new subjects. The French turned the Sultanate of Morocco into a Western Caliphate. The Dutch cultivated loyal leadership in Java, and the British prepared to return the Caliphate to the Arabs, including creating the brand new position of the Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, as the Ottoman Empire came under increasing pressures, their military defeats and political losses led to greater spending on global religious affairs. Ottoman spending increased as Istanbul professionalized its clerical establishment, a sort of counter-reformation commonly known as pan-Islam throughout the empire and beyond. And despite the fears of European empires, this actually pushed the Sultan Caliphs closer to spiritual status as a global prayer leader and away from a political role. Up until the end, his was the only major Muslim land not under European occupation. And he was the only Islamic ruler with sovereignty over the religion's holiest sites. Now this outreach took place through the cultivation of the caliph's non-political roles, helping Muslims lead observant lives by sponsoring the largest global network of mosques, seminaries, and Sharia courts ever in operation. And to support this mission, Abdul Hamid also assembled an internationally diverse cadre of sheikhs and scholars and publicists, co-opting pan-Islamic allies whose influence extended well beyond the territories they controlled. As with the papacy, even as his number of subjects dwindled, the Ottoman caliph commanded the hearts and minds of hundreds of millions of followers. All of this ends abruptly when Ataturk abolishes the caliphate in the new Turkish Republic. But by then, the British had already ejected the Ottomans from Jerusalem, Mecca, and Medina and their global networks had already been fatally weakened. This is where the trajectories really begin to diverge. To bring this more fully into focus, we need to look at how each religion responded to the second defeat, the rise of the nation state. While the first defeat was inflicted by external actors, the second defeat was inflicted internally by national governments with secular agendas. For Catholicism, this took place through the civil constitution of the clergy in France, the Kulturkampf in Germany, and the church was brought under the oversight of new ministries of the interior who appropriated religious lands and properties, seized control of religious institutions, and commandeered the nomination of bishops and priests. 
This led to a loss of privileges, but it also led to the end of the church's public role in justice, education, and parliament for a time. The church responded with anti-modern broadsides, the syllabus of errors, the First Vatican Council, and of course, the army of Zouaves. But this was accompanied by a wave of institutionalization, leading up to a boom in higher education and diocese construction worldwide, letting the Pope evade national clampdowns and interference in the anti-clerical countries. So in the depths of diplomatic isolation, the Pope consolidated and expanded his spiritual influence to a global audience. After 60 years of isolation, the Roman question was resolved by the Lateran Accords. The creation of the Vatican city-state was an elegant earthly reply to the burning question of papal sovereignty on earth, allowing the Pope to exert temporal powers, albeit only with a thousand or so subjects, granted him dignity in defeat. After that turning point, the church recovered its internal autonomy nearly everywhere, again nominating its own bishops, and it started down a path of what I call soft restoration, running its own schools, its own seminaries, its own civil society organizations again. And across Catholic communities, this integrated a culturally alienated portion of the population back into each national community, helping to consolidate democracy over the course of the 20th century. Now, contrast that with the fragmented nature of Islam after the end of the caliphate. As Catholic politicians and statesmen had done in Catholic Europe, during the 19th century, so too did Muslim statesmen in Sunni-majority countries appropriate religious lands, usurp nomination processes in the 20th century. In the name of modernization, they too pushed traditional hierarchies out of public life, where they had played formal roles in education, justice, and morality. But in this case, there was no centralized locus of spiritual authority to counteract this process. And this left the premise of state legitimacy open for debate. The titular leadership of Islam passed to the Islamic affairs ministries of individual nation states themselves. But these Islamic affairs ministries, especially at the beginning, were often inadequate custodians of the religion. In the early years of the Republic in Turkey and Tunisia, these institutions died out as governments completely cut spending. In many cases, traditional observ observances like Friday prayer or Islamic burials were impossible because there were not enough mosques or imams to sustain religious life. Now this left average citizens with minimal familiarity with their own religion and vulnerable to other claimants to Islamic authority with competing political agendas. In particular, after 1979, the revolutionary ideology of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the stern and literalist Salafi Wahhabism of Saudi Arabia. The less that states invested in religion, the more vulnerable their citizens were to these cross-border influences. And as these movements grew in the 1980s, so too did the state religion apparatuses across the region grow. But these states treated religion as a matter of public order, to be managed by security officials and not by religious leaders. Today, Islam has largely remained stuck in that situation, in a situation similar to that of the Catholic Church during its 19th century struggle with anti-clericalism, with significant state involvement and restrictions on the religion's autonomy within its own institutions. Now, before 
proceeding to the conclusion, let's consider the impact of the third defeat, which is the era of mass migration. While these two religions were locked in combat with the secular state at home, each also experienced the growth of minority diasporas overseas. For the church, this was largely labor-driven migration to the US in the mid to late 19th century. And for Muslim majority countries, it was to Western Europe 100 years later. In each case, in addition to the labor migrants, some thousands of political refugees and violent extremists who were fleeing the same repressive regimes in their homeland also came and cultivated an audience amongst the labor migrants and their children. That is one reason why this mass migration might be considered a defeat, because of the exposure of, to the risks of diaspora life, where suddenly millions of Catholics and millions of Muslims lived permanently beyond enemy lines, where they lacked strong religious institutions and were susceptible to other influences. In the US, the church responded by building churches, schools, dioceses, training clergy and teachers to populate them. But all of this initially took place within the missionary congregation of the Propaganda Vide, meaning U.S. Catholicism was heavily influenced by the foreign interests of homeland networks in Europe. So the U.S. had more bishops than Italy or Germany, but unlike those countries, it had no national hierarchy of its own. Instead, it was under the reign of a single apostolic delegate who was always an Italian cardinal sent by the Pope. Rome put off accepting the permanence of the American minority, preferring to train US priests in Rome and resisting what it called the heresy of Americanism that was tainted by liberalism. So without enough churches or priests, there were issues with quality control and language barriers, and they had little ability to alleviate burgeoning issues of social integration. In US cities, immigrants suffered higher rates of incarceration and alcoholism in their neighborhoods, and they provided fertile soil for violent extremists who unleashed a wave of terror, bombings, and assassinations. Two assassinations in particular changed the course of US Catholic history and that of the church. First, Italian King Umberto, in 1900, who was shot down by a New Jersey anarchist, born in Italy. And the following year, US President McKinley, who was shot down by a second generation Polish American. These attacks were not inspired by religious ideology or Roman sympathies, quite the contrary. Authorities linked the political radicalization of young Catholic men to the absence of any religious background. So aside from a crackdown of 10,000 arrests and 1,000 deportations, there was also a move suddenly to address the shortage of priests in the US Catholic community. The number of clerical visas skyrockets in the first years after the assassination. And significantly, at this moment of deep crisis, President Roosevelt shunned the Italian apostolic delegate and embraced the American cardinal, James Gibbons. This helped push one of the thorniest questions to its logical limit. When would Rome end the state of exception? The episode culminates with US Catholicism's exit from the Congregation of Propaganda Fide in 1908 when the Vatican grants a US hierarchy under canon law. Rome slowly recognized more US seminaries to ordain US clergy, ending the importation of priests. An American-born hierarchy 
built up to replace the Italian papal representatives in the country. U.S. Catholics became a full constituent of the global church, with representation in the College of Cardinals and more U.S.-born bishops, many of those would go on to lay the groundwork for the Second Vatican Council. They filled dioceses that were created to re reinforce Roman control when the U.S. was still in the propaganda fide, but they set the stage for the feedback of personnel and ideas from the new world onto the old curia in the later 20th century. How does this compare to Islam in Europe? Well, the arrival of Muslims in Europe also coincided with violent political conflict in the countries of origin, which also spilled over to the diaspora. Countries of origin similarly delayed accepting the permanence of these diasporas, treating them as missionary branches without local autonomy, meaning a constant rotation of foreign personnel in schools and mosques. Still, there was never enough prayer space or religious education, and it was only a minuscule fraction of what existed in the countries of origin. When terrorist attacks struck European capitals, authorities discovered that, like in the case of the McKinley assassination, those who committed the violence had little to no religious background. To counter religious extremism, Europeans began working with sending states to import prayer leaders and to build mosques. But here is where differences emerge with US Catholicism because the integration of Islam in Europe has been marked by ambivalence. European governments embrace the Europeanist schools of Islam, but they reject any trace of homeland influence, preferring instead to wait for a composite Euro-Islam. But without a plan to pay for prayer spaces or the salaries of religious personnel, which homeland Islam can do, this is only aspirational. They reluctantly continue to rely on imams trained elsewhere, and they limit their numbers so there is an ongoing shortage. The impact of European Islamic seminaries will be limited if there is no place or jobs for their graduates. Beyond their Islamic budgets and fundraising capacity, the homeland leaders pictured on the right also have important roles to play in religious life and in the transition to spiritual rule. The Moroccan king is a holy figure for Maliki Muslims outside Morocco also. Turkish Islam is practiced by many millions outside of Turkish borders. But the spread of any trained professionals at all is largely thanks to the growth of national Islamic affairs ministries whose budgets have increased dramatically this century. The governments associated with them, Turkish, Moroccan, and others, have begun taking steps to remove European Islam from missionary status, treating Europe as a permanent home for Muslims. But they could do more with the right incentives from European states. The panic that was induced by political violence created a window of opportunity that is closing. European concern over outside influences provides a lens for interpreting the 21st century custody battle over international Islam today, which goes well beyond nation state boundaries and includes many more international players. No state sponsored Islamic networks have yet risen to the challenges of the 21st century there is no public appetite for Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but their charismatic leaders have drawn attention to the caliph's empty seat. Of all the contenders, Turkey has done the most to take up the roles of the old caliphate, sponsoring prayer spaces and training clerics worldwide, beautifying Jerusalem and so on. And this has taken on greater poignancy given the success of the Taliban in Afghanistan 
which has nearly half a billion Muslims in its immediate vicinity, including many whose religious life Turkey aims to shape. Demography may help determine the fate of which pro movements prevail. The Europeans may have returned the caliphate to the Arabs, but ethnically speaking, global Islam is now more than three quarters non-Arab. So what constructive conclusions can we draw? First, undermining traditional religious authority has rarely had the intended effect. And it can prove long-term disastrous by opening the door to new extremists. It is better for the state to respect traditional religious authority after its defeat. Religion politicizes when its basic rights are threatened. Second, sorry, both religion and state benefit from a civil society strategy and soft restoration. In today's context, the disestablishment of religion is not the answer. It's encouraging to see Muslim-majority states move towards granting more religious autonomy, taking Islamic affairs out of interior ministries, allowing imams to perform marriages, to hold elect elections for muftis, and these are small steps on the way to soft restoration and the resumption, eventually, of autonomy over mosques and schools and seminaries under the rule of law. But nation-state Islam should not be rushed off stage before progress is made in repairing the breach of political and religious legitimacy. Third, theological training is vital, especially in the absence of a caliphate. The state-led initiatives to train a new generation of imams are indispensable. These imams and ulama should be trained in sufficient numbers to serve not only the homeland, but also allowed to develop local autonomy within the diaspora. The future will include multiple centers of religious authority. And finally, following the Catholic example, example of the Second Vatican Council, the expansion of religion as a prominent minority in the periphery or mission countries may feed back into the traditional core and help moderate it. This takes time. It also required the end of the US community's temporary missionary status. That is what gave the US church a voice in the Curia and in the College of Cardinals, which are, of course, the bodies that set the policies and elect the pope. It also activated a feedback mechanism within the church's own global institutions that helped define a new approach to democracy and pluralism through the Second Vatican Council. Now, there is no caliph, obviously, to sign an equivalent peace treaty like the Lateran Accords, but a symbolic resolution with some of the new central figures is possible. Without that, there is little chance for the pluralist experience of religious minorities in the West to feed back upon the Muslim-majority world. And the democratic right to free religious exercise will continue to be seen as a hindrance to political integration when it may just need help finding its rightful place within the new order. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and now I would like to invite Michael Dreisen. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for this invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, okay. Um, I want to just begin by saying something very briefly about the book itself and, and its quality. I um, uh, this past year, I had the honor to preside over a, a book award, uh, the Morkin Book Award in Religion and Politics for our um, APSA uh, Political Science Association. And we had 25 excellent books uh, that we had to choose from. And Jonathan's book really just stood above the rest and received the unanimous uh, accolades uh, within the committee. 
Um, we were just so impressed uh, by its uh, breadth, by its ambition, um, by the way in which it tried to do this comparison, uh, but also by the excellent writing. Uh, all the footnotes and images, which don't quite do justice up here, but um, made it just a rich and enjoyable read uh, in a usually pretty dry field. So wonderful work. Um, it was also the longest book, so maybe that's a good way to, uh, to go for it. Um, for myself personally, it was doubly important um, because I'm someone who also works uh, in the scholarship um, and uh, my own uh, research has been marked by a very long and painful struggle to contemplate these histories of Islam and Catholicism in a, in a comparative hold. Um, so I really applaud the efforts to do so, and I think um, that this kind of comparison, and others like it, should be more uh, at the heart of our uh, political reflections, despite how difficult they may seem to be. So, all this to say, I'm a big fan of this book, um, and I'm a bit at a loss for critique because I find some of it uh, to be innovative and interesting. But here I am, um, so let me offer a few thoughts on the book and uh, some reflections, uh, questions which were raised in my own mind, and I've uh, grouped my comments around three uh, broad sets of remarks. The first is on the question of holy empires, uh, which is uh, a first part of Jonathan's book. Now, one of the key features of uh, the book is the way in which it recenters our understanding of religion in the public sphere around the enduring institutional and ideational legacies of this century-long uh, transition out of imperial rule, uh, which Lawrence um, encapsulates in, this, in, in these institutions of the Pope and the Caliph. Now, I'm really sympathetic to that analysis. The, the institu those institutional legacies out of that transition, I think, are key for understanding politics in the Middle East today, um, as well as in Southern Europe. Um, but I'm also sympathetic to the type of similarities which he um, attributes to uh, these figures of the caliph and uh, the papacy, um, both in their political religious functions and their history of hostility to liberal modernity, but also in their divergences. And um, as, Lord, uh, as Jonathan has just uh, presented, um, in, in a way which I think is creatively uh, provocative, his insistence on this mega historical juncture um, which sees the Roman question resolved favorably for the Catholic Church through the creation of Vatican City, um, but less favorably for the Caliphate. So I like this, um, but I want to push a little bit on the meaning of the differences here, particularly the religious differences between these two institutions, which may also be at play in the story. And I was thinking especially about the, what we might refer to as the sacramentality, uh, the sacramental understanding of the position of the Pope, not primarily as a lawgiver over time, uh, but also as he who gives investiture, he who anoints. Um, I'm always struck uh, in the Vatican um, by uh, the prominence of paintings and, sc and sculptures with inscription, Fecit Regim, um, this Pope, was he who made this king a king. Here in a sacramental, but also in a political sense, as in providing a political theology of legitimacy. And I think the confused story of Napoleon and um, Pope uh, Pius VII is emblematic in this sense, um, and perhaps is different than in the history of the Caliphate. Partly as a result, I think, um, of this sacramentality of this position, the Catholic Church throughout the history of modernization has much more um, uh, insisted on organizational and theological independence. It sought to avoid uh, more fiercely the status of an established church and the making of bishops and priests as functionaries of the state, something which predates the Roman uh, question. They sought a confessional uh, religion state arrangement as opposed to an established religion state arrangement. In the Ottoman sense, um, the role of the Qadis, of the Imam as judges of family law, already had a much more clerical imperial function, which then embedded itself into the nation-state Islam that the book focuses on. I don't want to argue the trap that I think Jonathan wisely avoids of posing an absolute association between giving to Caesar what is Caesar and God is what is God's and some sort of a priori Catholic institutional preference for religious freedom or for separation of religion and state. Um, that said, uh, if we understand modernization as a story of multiple bureaucratizations, as I think Jonathan is doing somewhat in this book, then perhaps we could say that the modern bureaucratic organization of the Catholic Church was more characterized as a bureaucratization from within, as opposed to, in the Ottoman, post-Ottoman uh, sense, as a bureaucratization alongside of 
or within the state. I think I see this especially in the difference between the establishment of a Roman curia, the bureaucratization of the Catholic Church, as opposed to state ministries of religious affairs um, in uh, much of North Africa and the Middle East. Um, on many issues, the state takeover of Islam and Catholicism are similar when it comes to education, uh, civil uh, marriage, divorce, etc. But there in that institutional difference, the religious ministries of affairs which stick with us today um, as opposed to the, the, um, uh, the Roman Curia, I think is an important distinction. I want to linger a little bit longer here on this question of um, uh, religious difference and the, the equivalence from a religious point of view of the Pope and the Caliph as understood from within Catholicism and Islam itself. Now, I live in Rome, which is the seat of Peter, and it's difficult to not think about the question of apostolic succession, per, per, uh, particularly when reading this book. Um, the role of the Pope's authority uh, and its identification with the Roman Catholic Church, which has been central to intra-Christian debates for so long and sets the Catholic Church apart, um, in some of the pictures itself, there in the dome of uh, St. Peter's, in the biggest uh, Michelangelo marble possible, we have the inscription, Tu es Petrus, um, you are Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, um, which gives a heavy scriptural basis uh, to apostolic su succession attributed by Matthew in the Gospels itself to Jesus as fundamental to a theology of religious authority within the Catholic Church. And on this, I think um, the Vatican, First Vatican Council fits nicely into Jonathan's story for the way in which it emphasizes, re-emphasizes that authority within the modernizing period. So how central is the caliphate to Sunni Islam's religious understanding of itself? In my work um, on, Alg on Algeria, I was struck um, often by the writings of Ibn Badis, who was the head of the Algerian Association of the Ulema and was a key figure uh, conceptualizing Arab nationalism at the turn of the last century. Um, and I was struck by his writing, uh, particularly arguing against uh, the necessity of the caliphate. Um, he, like many others at the time, saw the caliphate as a symbol of corrupted Islam, as a compromised institution in ways which foreshadowed some of the imams uh, that Jonathan quotes in his book from Tunisia. I think there's a modernist, is, uh, reformist Islamic uh, angle here, um, which was captured within the Muslim intellectual milieu of the time. Ibn Badis understood the caliphate as a distraction from uh, contemporary religious reform. Um, you quote al, uh, al Ghani at some point, and I wish I knew more what Rida or Abdu and other modernists thought about the caliphate and how that might have impacted the thinking of the history and intellectuals uh, within Islamist, uh, contemporary Islamist movements on the question of the caliphate, who I think, the Islamists, I think, uh, show up less in this book than might be uh, necessary for um, uh, thinking about religious authority in contemporary Islam. One of the central interests, uh, concerns of the book is about the reconciliation of religion and the modern state. And one of the central claims, as Jonathan has just uh, said, is that the latter in PACs enabled this for Catholicism in powerful ways that Islam is yet to figure out. But I wonder um, whether the extent to which the strength of Islam and modernity, um, here also the, uh, about the Islamists uh, from Imbadness forward, um, has been in its capacity to hold modernity in tension with religious authority. From the point of view of raw numbers, Islam is in a much better spot today in terms of growth than Catholicism. The Pew Research Center's data has Muslim populations growing at more than double the speed of Christianity. And the fastest growing Christian denomination worldwide is not Catholicism, but Pentecostalism, that most unhierarchical and unbureaucratized of Christian movements. Um, all this brings me to my last point which is about the Catholic modern and religious democracy, which themes are dear to this center. Um, as you note in the conclusion here, my colleague Professor Fagioli can say much more, many within contemporary Catholicism openly wonder today whether ca Catholic modernity itself has been bad for Catholicism. And paradoxically, given the story you tell, um, are putting their cards all in on the intellectual revival of an idea of Christian nationalism. So there's a serious question here, which I found raised in the book in creative ways, of whether what is good for religion is also good for the modern state and vice versa. Now, in my work, I take seriously the accomplishments of Christian humanism. 
um, including its contributions to uh, Christian democracy, to the creation of the European Union, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Catholic Wave of Democracy, all things which would seem to confirm, um, almost to a T, Jonathan's thesis that the freedom gained by the Catholic Church ultimately made it more powerful as a spiritual and religious actor. But globally, that period has entered into a fragile, a new fragile and maybe liminal state. While some, like Pope Francis, um, have sought to renew some sort of Christian humanist tradition today, others see modernity as a categorical defeat for Catholicism. And again, that makes me wonder whether we're not at a risk of continuing to underestimate the extent to which Islam as a global religion is thriving, not just because of socioeconomic reasons, but in big part because of its vibrant critique of the modern state for all of the ways in which its unreconciliation with modernity has also buoyed its religious vitality, at least in some extent. In this sense, I have to say I must, uh, I'm less convinced uh, that the bureaucratization of Islam over time, its regulation by the state, uh, in and of itself represents a solution to the question of religious authority in Islam today. Not that the Ministry of Religious Affairs in Algeria can't play a dignifying role through a, a better or finer management of the religious field in the country, nor that total religious independence is necessary moving forward. Here I find myself much more convinced of the types of religious reforms that Al-Azhar dabbled in in the wake of the Arab Spring. Declarations on Fundamental Freedoms in 2011 and 2012, which offer the kind of state-supported but self-organizational mode that may render religious authority uh, credible over the long run. And my recent work on uh, interreligious dialogue initiatives in the region, which includes a great deal of modern nation state Islam uh, uh, across uh, the Gulf region, I also see encouraging signs uh, about the capacity of religious leaders in the region to reconstruct religious authority along the, these lines in a way which respond to social aspirations for pluralism, for religious freedom, and for citizenship, as well as religious renewal. And I'll stop right there. But thank you. Wonderful book. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation to discuss this great book, not just a big book, but a which I think is very important for uh, theologians, for ecclesiologists, for those who have a specific interest on Catholicism. My first part will be why this book is important to me and for my profession, I think. And the second part, some questions that came up from my reading this book. So this book is, a, is especially refreshing and honest for theologians because it acknowledges with a sincerity that has been lost uh, sometimes that the papacy and institutions do exist and they do matter. It's not all culture, it's not all society, it's not all um, untouchable uh, religion. It, it acknowledges that Catholic anti-modernity exists, that uh, we cannot solve the problem between Catholicism and modernity by um, predating and retrodating every moment by seeing modernity everywhere. I, I think, and as an Italian, as a church historian, um, I think uh, Italian history says something on the real existence of uh, a problem within Catholicism and uh, modernity is important because it provides um, a periodization that is, uh, is deeper than the usual periodization, which is there is first an imperial Constantinian church, and then at the beginning of the second millennium, there's uh, the Gregorian revolution, uh, and then there's conciliarism, and then there's the bourgeoisie. All these positions, they still matter, but I think that this question of defeat and of coping with a series of historical challenges um, is very important because it keeps together the institutional dimension of the church, 
in, in ways that are non-apologetical, which is in some ways the problem of the Catholic Church of, 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 of today, that every discourse on the institution runs this risk of being seen by default apologetical. That's, that's uh, not what this book says. This book, I found it uh, very important also because it uh, brought me back to uh, 20 years ago when I discussed my PhD dissertation, which was on the uh, appointment of the bishops in Italy after the Council of Trent. And there was a demonstrable uh, rise in the, um, in the possibility of becoming bishop if you had a degree in law in Italy between the late 16th century, early 17th century. That is clearly what uh, uh, Jonathan calls uh, the church's response as institutionalization and professionalization. This is, it's a pattern that it's clearly, uh, he has captured very well that dimension of, of the Catholic response. Um, and then from my dissertation 20 years ago to the, to the project I'm working on uh, in these last few years and for the next, I guess, five or 10 years, which is a history of the Roman Curia. And you see clearly that the history of the, of the Curia in its key moments, uh, 1588, 1870, 1929, the 1960s, is a way to see the the institutional Catholic Church and, and the papacy to respond against a particular defeat. 1588, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, 1870, the fall of the, of the, of the, uh, the papal states. 1929, there's not only one problem um, of fascism, but also the Great Depression, which has a financial impact on the Vatican and so on. Um, and so I enjoyed this book very, very much. Uh, one of the things that made me think this book um, is whether we need a, a fourth part with a, another defeat, probably. Um, we are in Boston. We are 20 years from the Spotlight investigation. And I do believe that the, that the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church is a, a challenge that is comparable to the one of the, of the Reformation. There are multiple layers, uh, theological, social, cultural, political, geopolitical. So this is something that makes me think uh, not just of how the church is dealing with the abuse crisis, but what has happened in these last 60 years since the Second Vatican Council. And my first question, I, be, uh, I mean macro question, is is the lens of the feet working when we talk about uh, Catholicism today uh, as a post-Vatican II church, as a post-conciliar church? Um, it is very true also for Catholicism, what Jonathan writes uh, about Islam, that there has been uh, a series of waves in the formation of these believers without borders, uh, the radio, the television, the internet, and so on. Uh, there's something more, I believe, that I think it has become visible to all those who work in the church that there, there is, I believe, one question, is institutionalization and professionalization in the church still something that is still going on, is still working, we still believe in it? Um, arguably, I think that if one looks at uh, who's running the church today uh, at the global level, I believe one question is uh, what kind of professionalization are these figures uh, 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 
coming from? Certainly not theology, or very few from theology. So there is, I believe, a question that we should ask, not at Boston College, which is one of the top schools for theological education in the world, but out of here, how much de-theologization the Catholic Church can sustain. Because this is really happening, I believe. Uh, this is happening because uh, theology has lost uh, much of its credibility. That is one of the effects of the abuse crisis. Um, it's a crisis that ha has, has affected the ability of the church to cope, to respond. Uh, those who were trained in ecclesiology, now they know or they should know that their job is basically ecclesiodicy, is how to justify the existence of the church, which is a different kind of job, I think. But finally, on this first point is this. Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, was certainly a moment of coping with defeat. Uh, the French Revolution, the 19th century, the two world wars, certainly. On the other hand, in some sense, paradoxically, I think that Vatican II, the core theology of the Second Vatican Council embraces defeat in this sense that there is at the heart of the Second Vatican Council this idea that is explained in the first short document that is approved by all bishops at Vatican II on the 20th of October 1962, in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, by the way, the message to the, the world which says basically, we as a church, we are here in the world to serve just like Jesus Christ did. This is a, an extremely kenotic statement, kenosis, radical self-humiliation. The Church of Vatican II is not the triumphant church that has in mind totally the idea of responding, but of becoming smaller. This is something that for some churches, like the United States, is very hard to accept. It's, it's a very complicated concept. It is paradoxical. So this is why Vatican II has um, an ambivalent uh, function, I think, in this uh, key of the response with defeat. Second question, uh, Catholicism and Americanization. Um, there's no question that uh, if Catholicism has understood and embraced democracy, uh, it's mostly because of the contribution of American Catholics, of John Crotty Murray, of the, of the experience of, 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 of American Catholics. It's what Jonathan calls the contribution of the peripheral countries into the core. The question is that right now, and I come as someone who still has an Italian citizen, as has seen the last election in Italy last month, the first hard right wing government in Italy since 1945. The problem is that Catholicism is no longer on the right side of history, okay, because history, especially in the Western world, um, as Cardinal Parolin said in, 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 in an interview a few weeks ago, has to face adverse weather. And he was talking about China, but I think he was implying much bigger picture. So what we are facing now is, is that one of the engines of uh, for the, the, the development and, and the uh, I mean survival of a certain idea of democracy and of rights and of freedom in the Catholic Church, which is American Catholicism, is no longer supplying that, or no longer in the same way 
it did because it is very divided also on that very uh, issue. This is something that ha has global consequences. It's not something that is, is it's limited to uh, this country, but um, it has global consequences. Um, and this book shows uh, how interconnected different places are in Catholicism as, as well. And so I believe this is uh, very important. Th uh, third and last point, uh, it's this, it's what Jonathan calls uh, the civil society strategy, which I believe is v very important, but what I see, uh, especially, again, as someone who spends part of uh, his time in Italy, uh, as a citizen, as a scholar, as a, I see that there is a fourth defeat probably that we must face because we have at the same time a crisis or a weakening of the institutional dimension of the, the church and at the same time of the civil dimension of the church, which is much more visible in some countries than in others. Uh, what is the effect of that? that in Italy, for example, the only place where Catholics can debate about something is in parliament, in politics. Uh, Catholic workers' unions, gone. Students' associations, gone. Uh, most Catholic movements, gone, except for Sant'Egidio and Communion Liberation, but it's a different kind of, uh, of player there. And so the question is, have we given up on the institutions and at the same time on civil society? There is a substantial stratum of institutions that is still holding the things together. For example, in Italy, it's still in effect the Lateran Treaty of 1929. It's still that it was updated lightly in 1984. But that is all we have. That is, is a question that I have. Um, and I think that uh, the key of defeat is extremely effective. I wonder if there is another defeat that we have not accepted yet, that we have not declared. And this book helps us very much uh, asking this question. Uh, for our times and for the times to come. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Looking forward to this uh, conversation. So it's interesting, you know, I've, I've joked sometimes that if there was another religion I'd consider joining, it would be Catholicism. And um, it's like my number one option besides what I currently am, which is Muslim. And the interesting thing is that after reading Jonathan's book, where I might have said previously that there's a 1% chance of me converting to Catholicism, after this book, it's lower. It's like 0 0.5. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that was Jonathan's intent. but um, So this is, this is the, a rare book that is very impressive, ambitious, and this is the way people should write books, quite frankly. That said... I have some pretty strong disagreements. I don't know if that's precisely the reason that Jonathan invited me to be on this panel, but regardless, that is the role I'm, I'm going to play. And hopefully we can talk about some of these uh, disagreements more in the conversation. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll start off with is defeat, the idea of a religion being defeated and then coping with defeat. Um, 
At a basic level, I would say that Islam didn't accept defeat in the way that Western Christianity did. So the mainstream of Christian denominations, they liberalized, they made their peace with secularism, they did all of that. And depending on your perspective, that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. And I'll get to that later. But um, Islam didn't do that. Um, Islam has resisted secularization, liberalization, and it has maintained a pretty vigorous posture in politics. It continues to play an outsized role in political life. I would say that in some sense it refuses to be domesticated or tamed, if you will. That's just more conceptually from a scholarly standpoint as someone who studies this. As a Muslim myself, I have to confess, I've never really thought of Islam being defeated. So that was a little bit hard for me to get my head around, and I don't think there are many Muslims who would consider that Islam had been defeated, was recently defeated, or is in the process of being defeated. But there's some really rich things that we can sort of draw out of the question of defeat and how people of a particular religion per perceive that. On the role of clergy, I have a disagreement there. And uh, Michael already touched on this, but I think it's worth putting a finer point on it. At a fundamental level, clerics in Sunni Islam don't play the same role that they do in Catholicism. Um, I, think it's I think it's hard to compare them. And I get that, you know, as political, I'm a political scientist myself, you know, sometimes the comparisons aren't perfect, but you do the best that you can, and there's still interesting things that you can learn from a comparison. But here I think the gap might be, in some sense, a little bit too large. Um, so you can practice Islam without talking to or seeing a cleric for many years. I personally uh, don't think I've really interacted with a cleric in a long time, and I had to think to myself, is that even a thing that we as Muslims do? Would we really need to talk to a, a cleric? Um, that said, I mean, personally, the clerics I do consult by way of reading, um, they tend to be dead, so that's another, I think, complication. So, the, you know, you can just go back and read things from several centuries ago, but current clerics who are alive, you know, different story. Okay, so, Defeat clergy, two things. Now I want to get into, I think, where some of my biggest concerns with the argument are, and that's the role of the state, the nation state, the modern state. I've changed on this. Um, I don't know if any of you, I can't, uh, have known me from before. I don't have great vision far away, so I don't know if there are familiar faces here. But I think that I used to take the nation state for granted. I used to think it was the best way of organizing society. I, it didn't even occur to me to question the nation state. It just so happens that in recent years, I've started to develop a kind of dislike of the nation state, not necessarily in practice, but as an idea, as a theoretical construct. The more that I've worked on Islam-related questions and theology in recent years, the more that I've come to the conclusion that the nation state was in some ways the worst thing that could have happened to Islam. And if I could undo history, well, there was no way to undo it. The nation state, there was no way that Muslims were gonna forestall that or avoid its impact. That's just the way the world worked. Um, Islam, and here I might put Islam in quotation marks because we can always debate what do we mean when we say Islam, but Islam, from the standpoint of a believer, um, Islam wasn't designed for the nation state, almost by definition. It was revealed, um, as we Muslims believe, by God um, at a time when the idea of the nation state did not yet exist. So part of the problem that we have, um, particularly in the modern Middle East, is that um, we have a bunch of nation states that are creatures of post-independence and post-colonial developments. And that really wasn't what Islam was intended to fit under. 
Um, so that's just something worth keeping in mind. Now, to go to, go to why is the state? Why do I have this gripe against the state? So I think it's a really interesting argument and one that I haven't seen marshaled over the course of like a proper book that I recall. So I appreciate that Jonathan has laid out the ideal case for the role of the nation state in the Middle East. Someone had to do it, I suppose. So um, that's there. And if you want that case, Jonathan's book gives a very, uh, as compelling as you're probably gonna find. Um, I think that, so one of the arguments Jonathan makes is that, um, so for example, that the state will always have to regulate the role of religion to maintain its own religious neutrality. Um, but the problem here is that if the state directly regulates the role of religion, then it cannot be religiously neutral. When you actually go to how these states do things with their ministries of religious affairs, they are always being non-neutral in the sense that whenever the state with its own particular interest and its desire to preserve itself as a regime, when it steps into the realm of religion, it cannot be neutral because it has interests, because it wants to preserve itself. So this idea of the state playing a religiously neutral role through its regulation of religion, I don't really understand how that works conceptually and in practice. But I would maybe pose even a broader question, why should religion accept the dominance of the nation state? If you don't share that premise, then you diverge, and that's a pretty fundamental thing. And each and every one of us should ask ourselves, why should religion, a particular religion, in this case Islam, or for that matter Christianity, why should it defer to the nation state? It's not self-evident to me. Elsewhere, um, Jonathan talks about um, some of the things that the state does that, as far as I can tell, he thinks are positive. Now, it's interesting because as I was reading them, I had the opposite reaction that all the, a lot of the things that he seems to think are good about the state in the Middle East actually kind of frightened me. And I'll just give a couple examples. And I, you know, I'm also just trying to offer up some good fodder for conversation. I do believe this, of course, but I think it'll be fun to talk about it. Um, that religious bureaucracies prevent political parties from entering the religious marketplace. True, but why should political parties be prevented from entering the religious marketplace? Another thing, that these religious bureaucracies that are run by the state guarantee stability through the management and oversight of services in this realm. You know, so basically guarantee stability. Why should stability be the number one priority? I actually am someone who is very much opposed to the idea of stability in the Middle East because that, that means in practice authoritarian regimes that justify their perpetual existence by referring to their stability, but of course they aren't stable as the Arab Spring showed us. Authoritarian regimes are stable only until they're not and then it's too late. And I would argue on a more basic level, authoritarian regimes are inherently unstable by definition. In my view, there is no such thing as a stable authoritarian regime. You can extend that beyond the Middle East to China, Russia, so on and so forth. Um, one reason I never bought the whole rise of China thing, but that's a different story. Other things that are in the list that Jonathan puts forward that I want to problematize here, that um, in the case of Morocco, for example, I think he's saying that it's positive that the king of Morocco is the only one who's allowed to intertwine politics and religion and not political parties and not imams. But is that good that the king is the only one who can do that? Why, again, why shouldn't political parties have the right to engage on religious issues? Because Islam and Islam, it's difficult to separate religion and politics. And the idea that these are discrete, separate categories is itself a post-enlightenment innovation. And I would just, 
I don't actually believe that religion and politics are two separate categories, but I digress. Another example, that um, in Morocco, and as well as other, several other countries, imams were dismissed for participating in political events. That's not good from my perspective. Why shouldn't a cleric, an imam, a jurist be able to participate directly in political events? So on and so forth. Okay, um, as I close up here, I wanna just bring some of these different strands together. Um, I guess my biggest issue here is I don't want the nation state to consolidate itself in the Middle East. So if that's where we're going or if that's the idea of where we should go, that makes me very, very nervous. I would, I would prefer to weaken the nation state in the Middle East and also to weaken religious bureaucracies. But this is also where I think some of my Americanness comes out. The idea that there are ministries of religious affairs, I find to be offensive. The idea that the state can regulate religious knowledge and production. To me, that is something that is worth fighting. Um, and I know that obviously European governments have a different approach to some of these questions. That's one of the reasons I'm not European. But um, so I think that, but there's a bigger and more serious issue here is that when, when the state manages religion in this way, it means that Islam is still being weaponized. Islam still is being politicized. And I would argue that one of the reasons Islam has become so politicized in the last five, six, seven decades is precisely because of what regimes were doing by trying to limit what people could say and do in the name of religion. And they created in part a reaction. So in my view, if we look at the record of these ever expanding nation states that have asserted their control over the religious domain, I don't see a story of progress or stability or anything particularly good. I see a story of an authoritarian status quo. And I'll just end with this. Um, we, don't, we don't have to disband these ministries of religious affairs, but I think what we can think about, what we can imagine as a kind of middle ground is a move, God willing, over time towards more democratic government. And then you have a situation where, first of all, these religious ministries can at least be weakened somewhat or made independent somewhat. They're not gonna disappear overnight. As Jonathan says, that is not realistic. But we should think about elected, so elected governments are the ones who can, if they win an election, they can introduce uh, changes and reforms when it comes to religious bureaucracies. And there, in, th in that way, state institutions can more accurately reflect the public mood and public preferences. But for that to happen, we would need to shake the authoritarian state in the Middle East. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, thank you to, uh, very much to each of you these thoughtful remarks, which are, um, you know, are indeed part of the thought for me to, to keep on uh, chewing over. Um, let me just take, you know, a very short amount of time because I, I, I want to hear uh, more questions and comments from, from the public. Uh, I just want to clarify, perhaps moving backwards, a couple of things um, from what Shadi said. Uh, a lot of what I do in the section on the on nation state Islam is is actually just try to convey what is happening. Um, so it's actually not from a stance of approval. I admit that I don't follow it with condemnation, but nor do I praise. I'm trying to to kind of show what these ministry officials think they are doing. And in so doing, I'm drawing an analogy to another part of history, which I also do not want to return to, which is the, uh, it, it was a quote unquote liberal time in the late 19th century in Europe, but it was highly repressive of, of religious liberty, of religious life. 
Um, and so I, I find there's an analogy between what the Muslim governments are doing today to the Islamic religion and what Catholic governments did to Catholicism uh, in the late 19th century. And, and that is, was never meant to be the end state. I, I view it in retrospect, by the way, I can't say that I would have seen this you know, from 1895, but in retrospect, I view it as a necessary passage in this gradual coping with defeat. And, and so I would also distinguish that I'm not using the word accepting defeat. I'm not using the word embracing defeat. Because I, I, I agree, I don't believe that religions should ever have to bow their, you know, their head definitively to, uh, to the state sovereign. However, they do have to deal with the reality of uh, who has the monopoly on not just violence, but the entire state apparatus, you know, all of the services that they would like to provide have to go through a central clearinghouse now, and that is the state. And so my preferred end state, insofar as I have a preference, is actually the return of autonomous governance to the religious communities. And so I'm, I believe I'm sort of offering, again, a kind of retrospective formula for how do you get there? How do you get to the point that, that religious communities don't have to deal with a ministry official telling them what they can or cannot preach uh, or which, uh, which activities they may or may not engage in? And so I see that process as what I call sort of soft restoration. And if you look at the, um, at the case of the Catholic Church, uh, you know, you might on the one hand, I think as, as Michael was, was saying, you know, ask yourself, well, why would Islam want to follow this path towards, um, you know, sort of being removed from power, being removed from all these positions, being removed from a position of strength? Um, and I argue that through soft restoration that the church and other religious communities actually gain back much of their roles, their previous roles that they held in society, albeit not any longer in a political executive way. So what do I mean? The Washington Post had an interesting graphic just the other week on the number of hospital beds um, that are in the United States that are located in Catholic hospitals. I think it's one out of seven of all acute care beds are now in Catholic hospitals. I'm not saying this is good or a bad thing, but from the perspective of a religious community, this allows the religious community to influence the, uh, the health and lives of their, of their followers, right? This is something that is of interest to them. If you look to the, um, the role of religious education, this is again only after having passed through the very repressive period, you find that even in you know, highly secular France, probably like 15% of students are enrolled in Catholic schools. That's, that's like in Turkey today under Erdogan and the Imam Hatip schools. So you can have a situation of defeat uh, where you're sort of removed from you know, the, 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 the ministerial level, but you actually gain again the role that you as a religious community want to play in forming the next generation, in caring for people in their, in their lives. Um, uh, so that, that is what I would call the, that, that's what I was appealing to with what Michael called the, the civil society strategy, and not recommending that things stay the way they are in, in the Middle East. Indeed, I'm trying to, to point to a way forward that is after this phase of what I call subjective uh, civilian control of religion. And in the book, I did not um, inflict this on you, but there is a, a lengthy analogy with Huntington's analysis of the civilian control of the military and of the monopoly on violence. Um, and, and, the, the, and the idea there is that, like uh, with uh, militias uh, before uh, modern states were consolidated, uh, the priestly classes were also highly differentiated, variegated, some were trained, some were not. Uh, bishops were essentially appointed based on their friendships or, or acquaintances. Um, and then there's a moment of professionalization when the militias are essentially taken under the control of the, center state, the central state and the state asserts its monopoly over violence. 
However, the state also returns a degree of autonomy to the militaries through acts like the court martial, right? Allowing the military to administer, in a sense, its own internal justice system. Now, again, I don't have a, a value judgment about this. I'm just observing the ways in which you take a sort of previously unwieldy set of professionals, gear them towards a state purpose, and try to capture the kind of collective good that they are producing on behalf of the nation while still acknowledging that they have their own traditions and their own institutions. Um, and this is related to me um, to the, the point that Massimo makes about the fourth defeat and, for example, the, the, the spotlight investigation. Because I see the, um, the reluctance of, of various churches and church institutions over time to cooperate with, um, with, with law enforcement as a leftover of this mentality of the court martial, right? This notion that justice can be administered internally within an autonomous zone. Of course, that failed. And that's what the spotlight investigation revealed. And indeed, in just the last five, 10 years, we've seen for the first time, you know, there was a, an FBI raid on, an, on the Archbishop of Philadelphia. Just yesterday, the Diocese of, of Buffalo um, had certain of its, of its powers taken away by the secular state for the first time, right? And so if we really zoom out and look at this in historical terms, we're, we're, still, um, we're still in a moment of, of the church adapting to this ultimate defeat, and I would see that um, disobedience vis-a-vis -vis the state over the last you know, 50 years in that, in that light. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I'm very engaged by, by all of your, your comments, and, and I thank you, and I, I'd love to hear, um, to hear more from, from all of you. Thanks. There are microphones. Um, yes, there are, so there are microphones. Uh, on the sides of the room, and there's also people to pass them around, so. Are there any questions from the audience immediately? Uh, while you all are gathering, your, you have a question? Okay, go ahead. So, uh, Please introduce uh, yourself. My, my name is Guy Beiner. I'm a professor of Irish studies, so I don't deal with these topics, but I'm looking at it from the outside. Um, the, the, the first point I wanted to make, just to me, it's kind of obvious perhaps, but we have, very elementary, is we have, when we talk about defeat, it comes with a whole baggage of negative connotations. But as your book makes it very clear, but we should have known that already in advance, defeat is seen as negative, whereas triumph is seen as positive, right? We have this kind of notion. But in fact, defeat, as you show here, is essentially crisis, is challenge, and it's a regenerative moment. It's a moment that you have to change and adapt to. Whereas exactly triumph is the moment that you can be complacent and not adapt, and then you're stuck in a moment of not moving. So it's an agent of dynamism. That's just a, an observation. It's in our language, because just choosing the word defeat itself, we kind of run with it, and it, we stay with the baggage. But the question I wanted to ask is about how schematic is what's happening here. Um, in a place where we have multiple agencies, so we talked, especially now, and I know the book is much more uh, complex, but in the discussion now, we've reduced it to the state and the church, or the state and religion. But as we know, there's multiple religions. There's also multiple other agencies, but I'm saying if we want to focus on religion for the moment, in Europe alone, the Catholic state hasn't had hegemony like, in the way it's being presented, way before the period that we're dealing with, right? There's always been, as you say, from the Reformation, we have the Protestant church, we have the Orthodox churches, we have multiple churches. In the same way, Islam is not one homogenous place, as you say itself. There's different kind of delegated caliphates, different places, but it's not only the caliphate. There's Sunni and uh, Shiite and other contenders all the time. In fact, we can add to that the rise of secular religions. You could add to this if you want to say socialism as a, as, as a religion which is competing within this market. So, so I think it complicates to think of it as a, as a multiple agency notion which is, which is competing here. There's no, it's not a, a dichotomy and that makes it a more complex chess game if you wish. Thank you. Perhaps we collect a few questions yeah, and then... Yes, please. Uh, my name is Peter Hall. I'm, uh, I'm also not an expert. I'm a professor in European studies. 
uh, and um, uh, I think for any, uh, this is a remarkable piece of scholarship, and so any question from me certainly is going to seem simple-minded, And but here's my simple-minded uh, comment question. Um, uh, as, as I hear it, and to some extent uh, read it, uh, the fall of the caliphate is, it assumes very considerable importance in the uh, divergence in these trajectories. And I'm wondering uh, how much importance you might ascribe uh, to something that's a little bit different than that, that is a combination of uh, the internal organization of the Catholic Church. In other words, I'm wondering whether, uh, it, uh, it, it, so uh, the, the variable is a, uh, is a combination of the, uh, the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. You know, this is, that this is my rock on which I found the church uh, from the beginning in a very hierarchical way. Uh, plus uh, the doctrinal support for that um, in, uh, in long-standing Catholic doctrine. Uh, doesn't that, from the outset, put Catholicism in a very different position uh, than uh, Sunni Islam, about which I know much less, but uh, about which I have the impression of a very different uh, doctrine on the one hand and um, early religious organization on the other. And I'm just, I, I think those issues are not absent from the book, but I wonder if you could just draw them out a little bit. And what, finally, what makes me think that um, is, um, I'm waiting for the next book you write, Jonathan, uh, which will uh, add Protestantism to the mix. Because when I think about Protestantism in the terms of this strange variable that I've just alluded to, uh, I think of, that it looks a lot more like uh, Sunni Islam than it looks like Catholicism, and uh, I imagine its trajectory to be more like that of Sunni Islam than of Catholicism, and that then seems to prove my own little theory here. One more, and then we'll get right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Nacht. I'm a first-year law student here, and I studied political science and Middle Eastern studies at Columbia undergrad and spent some time in the State Department. Um, I wanted to ask this question to Dr. Hamid, who I had the pleasure of last hearing speak at an event three years ago before the pandemic in D.C. Um, in uh, recent in recent times, we seem to be witnessing a rejection of perhaps past social trends in the Islamic world, specifically in the Middle East. You, from the late 70s through, uh, through the first decade of this century, we seem to see a lot of popular movements in favor of a greater role for Islam in government and for Islam in society. Uh, most were peaceful, some of the most famous ones were not, of course. Um, but now we see protests that have a very secular focus in Iran. We saw sort of anti-clerical um, anti and anti-religious uh, sort of authority protests in Lebanon a couple of years ago. Um, we seem to be witnessing more support for secular democratic mo governments and movements and pluralism rising across the Middle East. And um, at the same time, it seems like in the West, we're seeing a growing support for Christian nationalism. So I was wondering if you and any of the other speakers could, could comment on these two disparate trends where we seem to have an increasing rejection to de democracy and modernity here and an increasing acceptance of it in the Middle East. Great. Shadi, would you like to begin? Uh, you want to start? Or sh okay. Um, so, a couple things on, on, the, on the issue of defeat. Yeah, I mean, defeat can and often is a good thing if you're able to learn from certain lessons and all that. I, I do think um, that Islam, in quotation marks, uh, has more difficulty with the idea of defeat 
for complex historical reasons. I think one of them is that Muslims were never really um, a minority living under the rule of others, more or less from the founding. And of course, Prophet Muhammad was the head of a proto-state. And really ever since then, I think Islam, Islam as it manifested itself in real life, had became accustomed to not being in a position of defeat. That's one of the reasons I think that it's been such a challenge to accept what went wrong, so to speak. I mean, I think that, you know, as it, as it, when we think about civilizations, it's hard for me to think, I'm sure there are others if we look somewhere in history, but it's such a precipitous fall from grace that Muslims experience, absolutely devastating. And I just, I don't think there's an easy way to recover from that. And if we want to understand why there's sort of this constant source of ferment um, in various Muslim majority contexts and even Muslim minority contexts in Europe, I think that's part of the reason. How do you deal with such a, such a stark rise and fall where I think Christianity's trajectory for obvious reasons related to its founding um, is a little bit different. Um, but I, I do want to, um, uh, on, the, on, on your question, which is a great one, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, and there's also the issue of Protestant versus um, Catholicism and like what's the better comparison? I'm sure Jonathan will have more to say about that, but just a very quick note that I think that in some ways Sunni Islam is in between. So yeah, Protestantism, Catholicism, I think that there are aspects of both that um, we see manifest in Sunni Islam. Obviously there isn't a rigid hierarchy and you don't really need clerics. That said, there is a normative tradition. So there is something called the consensus of the scholars. So if I have a question on a particular legal matter, this is what I was referring to when I talked about dead clerics. There is a pre-existing consensus that you can draw on where, um, and part of the reason you need that is because um, Islam is, has a strong legal aspect to it. I wouldn't want to overstate how, how important it is in Islam, but it's certainly more than Protestant. So if, if you don't have a law like Sharia, you don't necessarily need to ask a lot of questions about where something falls as a legal judgment. But growing up Muslim and dealing with these debates, you, you do have to know, okay, is this haram or halal? How do I find out? Where I've never really heard an evangelical say, well, oh, this thing that I just did, what do the scholars say? Do the scholars say that this is permissible or forbidden? And what is, and what is the consequence or punishment if I, if I I'm, 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 that's just something I haven't heard from my evangelical friends because that's just not, not the way they understand sin, so on and so forth. And then just la to your question um, about changes in the Middle East, Iran, I would just kind of bracket because I just, I think that Shia Islam or what Shia Islam has become as expressed in the particular case of Iran is so completely different from Sunni Islam that I just don't even know how we can really draw on the Iranian example to make a broader point. I mean, let's be honest, Khomeini made up a religious doctrine. I don't want to say completely out of thin air, but in, in a way he did. It has no precedent in Islamic history. It is in some ways ludicrous, but um, obviously compelling to some people, a, a, a dwindling minority in Iran. But I just, so there is a reason that I think Iranians are um, revolting against this um, mandate of the jurist or the guardianship of the jurist. Um, it's, it's a really bizarre doctrine that I think has far-reaching implications for the state and there's no comparison to Sunni Islam. Now, are there other contexts in which um, we see signs of secularization? So there was an Arab barometer poll um, two years ago that, and people were hyping it up, oh my God, secularism is rising in the Middle East. I actually looked at the data and there were just, so, in some countries, you had an increase from like 5% to 10% who self-define as not religious. That is a pretty big increase. It's like 
But the baseline in these conservative societies is already so thoroughly Islamic that even doubling the number of non-religious people doesn't get you all that far. Also, there was a mistake in the translation that, um, <laughs> so um, the word for, the phrase for not religious in Arabic is mishmutadayin, which means, which they translated in English as irreligious or not practice, practicing. What it means, um, what, what it means in, is, in Islam is that someone who who, who believe, might believe in Islam very strongly and have that strong basis, but they're just not, they're not very practicing in the sense that they may want to do more, but they're not actually there. That's always how I used to hear this phrase in, say, Egypt. People would sort of lament, yeah, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that religious, but that doesn't really tell us anything about their belief um, in the sense of not religious as in I'm not Christian or I'm not Jewish, if that makes sense. Okay, we'd like to invite... Uh, if I may respond to yes. this question on, on uh, the crisis of democracy in, in the West. I believe the real problem we have is not a collapse in the faith or in democracy, but in liberalism, in constitutionalism. So here, I mean, all these... I, mean, I can talk about Italy or I mean, Hungary. I mean, they believe in elections. They believe that if they win elections, they want to run. But it's gutted of a constitutional content, which is a problem for Catholicism because at the Second Vatican Council, more than one document says explicitly or hints at the fact that Catholicism in light of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the 19th century, believes that there is uh, a connection between the freedom of the act of faith and a certain constitutional system of life. And so that is, is, has been accepted. And this is clearly in crisis in some circles in American Catholicism, uh, in Italian Catholicism, my own country. So democracy, I mean, the question is for how long democracy can resist when you start taking away constitutionalism, right? I, I don't know that, okay? So now a completely different question is this that he says something on your question that since Vatican II, the experience of Catholics living in authoritarian, non-democratic systems has become more relevant. At Vatican II, it was exceptional or it, it, it was seen on its way towards a solution. If you think about Catholics in China today, or even in India, I mean, other countries where the freedom of worship of expression is very limited, this is a very different thing. So there are multiple crises, in the plural, that Catholicism is going through in its relationship with democracy. The European West is one, and then there's other continents where the problems are, uh, in some sense, unexpected at the time of the Second Vatican Council. So here, I mean, uh, Sam Huntington's book, I mean, Third Wave, was announcing something that hasn't delivered completely, or in some cases has, has gone back, I think. Michael? Yeah, just a uh, quick two things. One is uh, just following up on Massimo's um, comment here, and this is to your question about um, <coughs> what, I mean, liberalism in crisis on some level, and the response of religions to that. And, there's a, you know, in, in the book and in the way we've been talking about, uh, there's oftentimes this question about when will Islam catch up with uh, Christianity? When will Islam reconcile itself with the modern liberal nation state? But we're at a moment where liberalism is in crisis. And so I think it's this, um, you know, in, in the circles that I'm in uh, right now, particularly with interreligious dialogue, there's oftentimes a sense by Muslim religious authorities that we're in a good place. <laughs> you know, we're, um, it's you guys who screwed up and uh, we're in a good place to uh, respond to that crisis because we've held on to our vitality and we have resources that we didn't give up 
for um, fulfilling some sort of moral foundation which will make liberalism work in the long run. So I, I think that's interesting. We're sort of at this, and maybe that gets to your fourth crisis, but there's this sort of new moment uh, where religion has become extremely relevant again for rethinking uh, vitality and order within society. So that's one thing. Um, the second one, just brief on this, uh, uh, without uh, getting too distracted, but I mean, comparative religions is such a great <laughs> you know, uh, topic, but um, I think that there's a lot of interesting ways in which uh, Islam and, and uh, Sunni Islam and, and Roman Catholicism, and the Romans important, um, uh, are comparable. Um, but on one key element, and that is the institutional relationship between religion and state, Protestantism, I think, particularly Northern European Protestantism, is actually pretty similar. Um, they both have a sort of established church tradition, an established religious tradition, um, which the Catholic Church is, is really different on and, um, and is actually at the heart of a lot of the worst church-state conflicts that we see within uh, the European tradition, uh, the anti-clericalism in places like France and, and Italy and other places. You don't get that in the same intensity in the, in the Protestant uh, countries because there's a, a different understanding of the cooperative role that clergy um, have uh, as functionaries of the state. In fact, that's what they are. They're, they're paid by the state. Um, and in that sense, it's similar to uh, certain places within Islam. So that established differences, uh, similarities, is important and, and is at play here. Jonathan? Would you like the last word? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, take a, just take a minute because there is there is a reception with, with uh, food and drinks where I hope you'll you'll all um, stay and enjoy. Um, I, I really am learning a lot from my colleagues, as I expected I would. Uh, thank you um, for for your answers and thank you for those questions as well. Um, I I have to I have to think harder about um, you know my my answer to, to Guy and 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 Peter, um, but I guess. One aim of the book is to dash our understanding of what we think the essential nature of these religions is. And, and so I'm, I know you can find theologians to back up your schema. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to do is find historians and social scientists who will pick it apart and say, well, when actually did the modern church start to look like the modern church? Whether or not Peter was told that upon this rock, you know, why did it take 1,500 years if it was so elemental? Um, and, and the answer that I give is that it was encountering modernity in, in specific steps. And, uh, and I would say also that, you know, the, the, the Pope obviously acknowledges that there was, uh, you know, there's the Orthodox Church, there are all the Reformed churches, but, but he may in his heart feel that he is the Pope to all Christians, right, regardless of these divisions, and, and the Caliph felt very much the same way, and so in a sense we are, um, you know, allowing the artificiality of the Shia-Sunni distinction uh, to, to become koi, to become a, a, a real thing, whereas in fact, up until you know the early 1900s, the the Ottoman Caliph was was taking care of all of the Shia holy sites in Najaf and 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 elsewhere, um, and uh, and and I would and I would suggest that just like the Church, um, that the Ottoman Caliphate responded to these modern challenges precisely with the kind of bureaucratic impulses that we're describing, and that even though these seem to be resistant, that in fact they were adaptive. Um, but I'll, I'll end there and, and just thank you all again for, for being here. Yes, thank you all for coming and please join us in the back for a reception if you can. Thank you.